have you ever just thrown your hands up and said, I don't get it. Your child is bright, maybe even gifted, but they're not doing their work. They're disorganized. They're resistant. It feels like they won't. But what if they can't? Today, we're going to explore executive function with executive function ADHD and 2E coach Seth Perler. You'll get insights about your out of the box, underachieving students and some practical tools for building executive function. This is LD Expert Live. Welcome to LD Expert Live, your place for answers and solutions for learning disabilities, dyslexia, and attention challenges. We're live every Tuesday at 10 a.m. Pacific. I'm your host, Jill Stowell, founder of Stowell Learning Centers and author of At Wit's End, A Parent's Guide to Ending the Struggle, Tears, and Turmoil of Learning Disabilities. To get a free copy, go to parentsatwitsend.com. Hey, we have a powerhouse show for you today. Seth Perler is the guru when it comes to executive function, so get your questions ready. Let's get started by saying hello to Lauren and all of you who are joining us live today. Good morning, Lauren. Good morning, hello. Uh, we already have some people checking in. We already have some uh, comments. We have uh, Karen who's really excited about today's show. She says, I'm so excited about today's topic because I follow both SLC and Seth Perler. Stoll's training has helped my son with auditory processing disorder. One, understand how his brain works, and two, make changes in his thinking and executive function practices to make learning easier. Since graduating from Stoll, my son will even indulge me and listen to an occasional Seth blog and discuss with me its application to his life. My son's executive function skills are so much stronger due to Stoll's training, Seth's blogs, and the right academic setting. It looked like it got cut off, but great. Already fangirling um, about today's topic. I know today's topic is really relevant to a lot of parents executive function. Um, so start posting your questions and comments. Um, and we'll try to get through as many of them as possible. Also, let us know that you're here and where you're checking in from. Okay, really looking forward to today's show. Great. Thank you, Lauren. This is LD Expert Live. I'm your host, Jill Stoll. And our guest today is Seth Perler. Seth is a well-known executive function coach, educator, vlogger, and a guy who cares about seeing outside the box kids succeed. He helps struggling neurodiverse learners turn it around so they can function in a baffling education system and launch a successful future. His weekly blog, sethperler.com, gives parents and teachers game-changing answers to help their students navigate school and life. Welcome, Seth. Good morning. Good morning. Good to see you. It's so great to have you. You have some incredible online resources for parents and teachers and students. Talk a little bit about your mission and why you're so passionate about executive function. Okay. Well, first of all, Jill, I just want to say thank you to you for what you do and how you show up in the world. Jill and I got to know each other uh, recently, and um, I just always appreciate meeting a kindred spirit and just somebody whose life is really dedicated to serving kids. So I just want to thank you for how you show up. Your show is so super cool. I'm so impressed, mm -hmm. and I, I just love it. I'm, I'm like going, how can I do this? This is a, you're, You provide an amazing service to uh, families. So thanks so much for how you show up. Well, thanks, Seth. So now, what was the question? Why do I care so much about this topic? It kind of, yeah, kind of your story behind becoming an executive function coach. Yeah, so um, I was that student. So I was the student that I help right now. So there's the uh, the the wounded healer syndrome. You know, I, I was somebody who struggled. Um, literally, my report cards or um, progress reports, starting in first grade, started saying messages like. Um, doesn't try, needs to work harder, mm -hmm. uh, is lazy, unmotivated, daydreams, daydream was a big one for me, um, does not pay attention, things like this. And so that's first grade. So obviously it got worse from there. But what ended up happening to me was that once I did get 
somewhere around middle school. And this is the pattern that I really see with a lot of my students. I started getting very disillusioned and disheartened and really more and more resistant. Uh, and different kids deal with this differently. But in my case, what I did is I just sort of faked it enough to get my parents uh, off my back. That was my strategy. I just did the bare minimum to try to keep them off my back and stay off the radar. I I just was not, I, I really felt like I didn't know how to do what I was being asked to do. And then I would hear messages like, well, we know you can do it. We've seen you do it before. And I, I was like, yeah, but I don't know how to explain to you that I can't do it for whatever reason right now or what, I, you know, I just didn't <clears throat> have the words for that. So anyhow, I was that student. I almost failed out of high school. I went to college on probation because my grades were low, but my test scores were high. I failed out of that college, Ball State University. I went straight into another college because I thought you were supposed to be in college. So I got into a community college in Columbus, Ohio. Uh, I dropped out of that one before I failed out. And essentially, I became a person who I really um, didn't believe that I could accomplish anything in life. Mm -hmm. um, I just felt like I didn't have really a lot of choices or possibilities and I really played the victim. Uh, it's everybody else's fault, the, the society's fault, teacher's fault, blah, blah, uh, parents' fault, everybody else's fault but mine. And really just was pretty, pretty um, stuck, pretty mm -hmm. stuck. And finally, um, I really wanted to turn my life around. I really knew that I was very limited and unhappy. And I did. And I worked harder than I ever worked in my life. And somehow I got this random job working with kids, fell in love with it. One day driving on Spring Mill Road in Indianapolis, Indiana, turning this curve after leaving work, working with kids. I was like smiling. I had this smile plastered on my <laughs> face. And um, and in that moment, I was like, this makes me happy. I, I want to serve kids for the rest of my life. So that was the defining moment for me. And then I became a teacher, got a master's in gifted and talented, taught all sorts of different ages, grades, subjects, um, and really um, to sort of wrap it up, you just just became disillusioned then with the system and very frustrated that I felt that I couldn't do the job that I had signed up for or that I couldn't do it to, you know, I, I feel like life is short and precious. You know, we have a hundred years here on earth maybe. And, and I really wanted to do my work and I felt like I couldn't do that in that setting. So I, um, I, I left teaching in 2010 and started what I'm doing now. And I'm just, I, I love it because I can really authentically, focus on these kids who often fall through the cracks, who are often, as you stated earlier, the can't versus the won't, which we might get into today, but mm -hmm. who who really are at risk and their quality of life oftentimes uh, suffers because they don't have the executive function skills to navigate life very well. Therefore, they can't accomplish goals that matter to them once they start to matter. So my driving question is, how do we take these at-risk kids, whether they have an identification or not, doesn't matter. How do we take these kids who appear to be, quote, failing in the way that we evaluate them? And how do we help them uh, have an experience where they can really learn how to get things done, but not just compliant, um, mm -hmm. like really uh, so that we won't get into that discussion right now, but how can they get things done so that they can have choices and possibilities and opportunities in their future to really create a future that they want, not so that they just sort of settle for a job they get and yada, 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 mm -hmm. but so that they can really um, intentionally craft a, a good, good future for themselves. Well, I think your story and your mission uh, have got to be really resonating with so many parents out there. Um, it's, it's so frustrating for kids and parents to look at, you know, these kids with all this potential and they just can't get it together and don't know why. Let's, let's do a little executive function 101. Mm -hmm. Just what is executive function? So I always say that if you Google executive function right now, you're going to find uh, 10 or 20 definitions that are very clinical. And the problem with that is that 
Um, most parents and teachers have never even heard of executive function. The ones that have know a little bit about it, but it, it still seems like such an inaccessible concept. It's not. Mm -hmm. All executive function is, is it means how we get stuff done. That's it. How we get stuff done. Now, I'll break it down for you a little bit more, but it, it's not this giant concept that's so inaccessible. How we get stuff done. So how do we get stuff done? How do we get complex tasks done? What types of things do we get done? Well, the things that we're concerned about in this interview here, the things we're concerned about with our kids is how do they get their schoolwork done and their responsibilities done? Usually it's in those two broad, very broad categories. That's the problem. We're not worried about how they get their video games done and how they get their screen time done and how they get their sports or their interests or their hobbies or their art or their music or their social time done. Those things they don't have trouble with execution on. So that can be kind of baffling uh, for parents. But we are concerned with how do we get those things done? Well, how do we get those two things done, responsibilities and schoolwork? Well, we uh, the front part of our brain, the prefrontal cortex of our brain, the front third or so of our brain is the part that generally helps us to get these things done. So in order to get something done, let's take a very concrete example of writing an essay for a fifth grade class. In order to get that essay done, you have to be you have to be detail oriented enough to pick up on the instructions. You have to um, inhibit uh, distractions and focus um, on on the details. So you have to pay attention, concentrate, focus on reading the instructions or listening to the instructions from the teacher about the essay or reading through the rubric or whatever it is. You have to plan when to do that. You have to activate, you have to um, self-start. So basically procrastination or somebody who's unmotivated, they, they, they are somebody who isn't uh, is struggling to self-start to get started on that thing. And then task persistence means follow through and task completions me means that they finished it and turned it in with their name on it. And so uh, executive function, you'll hear experts say there are three aspects or there are five aspects or there are eight aspects. I talk about like maybe 20 aspects. So you have impulsivity, inhibition, attention, concentration, focus, um, the uh, you have um, planning, time management, organization, organizing your thoughts, organizing the things that you write, organizing your space or your school materials. Uh, so essentially, executive function has to do with anything that the brain needs to do in order to get these important things done. Now, were you going to ask something? Because I was going to talk no. about one very, very, very important thing. Go, go for it. Very, 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 very important thing about getting things done is that these kids often have tutors or pull out programs or punishments or rewards or any number of things to try to help them to execute more effectively. Um, there are many ways that we try to get them to do these things. But if we do not address one particular thing, we're missing a massive, massive, massive part of the whole battle here. And that is, is that we have to address with these kids their own resistance. So these kids are resistant often to parents, especially once they get in middle and high school, parents helping teachers helping, especially in middle school, looking different from anybody else in the class. They don't want any attention. They don't want to ask the teacher for help. And um, they're resistant to starting, the, meaning starting their homework. They're resist that's called procrastination, right? They're resistant to using planners or calendars in an effective and meaningful way. They're resistant to organizing their folders or their papers or their binders. Or th There's this resistance that comes up to all sorts of things. If we don't teach them what that resistance is and how to navigate it and how to work with it and that it doesn't have to rule us and, the, and that we have tools to understand the resistance um, and to have a, a relationship with our own resistance to doing things. If we don't empower them to work with that, then all we're doing is trying to use external measures to quote, motivate them or pressure them into doing what we think they should, what we value 
thinking that they should do at the time. So any program or person or intervention that fails to address this resistance thing to me is missing a, a massive, massive, massive opportunity to really serve these kids. Mm -hmm. And, and really to help them understand what that resistance is all about. And, you know, resistance is so tough for parents and teachers because it ends up looking like defiance or a motivation problem. And so, you know, then we get that big reaction to that from the adult. Yeah. These kids are very misunderstood and that does lead into the can't versus the won't really nicely. Mm -hmm. And, and I know you talk a lot about the issue of shame. And I, I really want you to talk about that because as adults, we do that to our kids and we, we, you know, sort of inadvertently maybe, but, but it, uh, can really hurt them. Yeah, nobody intends to shame anyone. Or maybe some people do, but that, that's that's not the people that are here and most people, most parents and teachers, they don't intend to do that. But we mm -hmm. have been raised in our cultures and subcultures and societies and family systems that have um, sent messages to us when we were young people and, and throughout our lives that shame is a good way to get things done. And what that means is, is that we see our child, whether it's a parent or a teacher or a principal or whoever, who needs to get something done, who needs to execute on something, we see them not doing it. So we either directly or indirectly send these shaming messages. And these shaming messages usually are, I kind of mentioned, alluded to this before, but something to the effect of, you're being lazy. Mm -hmm. You're not trying hard enough. You need to try harder. You need to pull yourself by your bootstraps. Why don't you care about school? If you just cared about school a little bit more, everything would be okay. Um, the, these sorts of messages, they're designed to use logic and reason with the child to somehow say, stop being lazy, motivate yourself, get motivated. You need to be more disciplined. So we're using logic. If, if you just did this thing, then you would get these things done. Your life would be so much easier. Don't you just understand why you're making this so hard on yourself? It'll only take you 10 minutes, blah, blah, blah. Like all of these messages, what they're communicating to, to that, the, these, the, the, these are communicating this, this shame thing. What is this shame thing? Well, that means that the person receiving the message, again, whether it's direct or indirect, because we can do this in very, 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 very subtle ways. And kids pick up on this stuff so quickly. Mm -hmm. They hear contempt, like it, like it's screaming, even if it's a whisper. They they feel it. It pierces them deeply. These are very sensitive human beings, and they don't know how to articulate it. They're just having an experience that ah, I have this pressure from this person or these people to do this thing, and I don't even know where to start. I don't even care about this thing. This is not an interest of mine. The way it's presented is not interesting, whatever the case may be, you know. Um, but the, they don't, they're not able to do the, what they're being asked. Now, you might think, well, I've seen, like I said earlier, I've seen them do it before. Right. Well, maybe they can cognitively handle the task, but they can't handle the vast executive skills that are necessary to regulate the emotion to get started on the task, to change their mindset, which was, oh, I can't do this, this is too big, to be like, oh, well, I can chunk it down and I have strategies, blah, 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 to get started. Um, so there, there's all of these things that, they're, that they can't do or, or haven't really integrated these skills yet. So they can't do it. So these kids, we use these messages to shame them. Um, in, in hopes that they'll get the thing done. And sometimes it works, which can be very misleading. But okay. oftentimes, like I was talking about my experience, it's just because I wanted them off my back, not because I was internally motivated or turned over a new leaf or something. Um, even if I told my parents, yeah, I'm different. This semester is different. Oh, blah, blah, blah. You know, oh, I'm so organized. Spend the first two weeks like getting all A's. Everything looks great, blah, blah, blah. And then it falls apart. So the shame really pierces. Now, here's the problem. The problem is, is when we inter 
internalize that shame. And what that means is when I start to think, I'm a worthless piece of crap. I can't do anything right. I'm a lazy failure. I hate mm -hmm. myself. Why do I always mess everything up? Why do I always screw up? I can't. You know, and we start to internalize, I'm bad. I'm wrong. I'm broken. I'm not okay. I'm not enough. I, I'm not good. Uh, I'm not worthy. We internalize that. Now, again, we may not be using those words, but we have this inner critic. We all have an inner critic. But what happens is that sometimes our inner critic, especially for kids who've experienced a lot of the shame, can be so loud. And mm -hmm. so they can be so hard on themselves that it really, A, does the opposite of what we want to do, which means that they become less motivated to actually take emotional risks to do the things we're be asking them to do, because they know no matter how hard they try, they're always going to be told in some way it's not good enough. You need to do right. the test corrections or you need to rewrite it or you need to finish it and resubmit it or, you know, it's all it's it just gets very daunting for them. But that when they start to internalize that and then become adults who have really internalized that, um, it really leads to uh, oftentimes years of and I'm sure many of the people watching, go ahead and put in the comments if this is you, but it often takes years for us to sort of sift through who we are and be like, I'm a good person. I'm okay. I Wow, that message, you know, I, I, I internalized that years ago. And like, we might have a moment where we think, oh my gosh, I remember in fourth grade when this happened and I got that message and and now I'm responding to, um, you know, some uh, a colleague with this and I'm connecting it to that. Oh my gosh, this stuff runs deep. You know, sometimes we have those experiences where we really realize how, how much we've been influenced by things like this, but right. You know, our, our brain does listen to our inner talk. And so if we keep giving ourselves that message, you know, we kind of then become that. And I've had kids say, Oh, well, I'm just lazy. You know, they, they now call themselves, things. Um, and I, I think you said something really important that there is, there are so many skills involved and we see them do something one time, or we see that they can do part of it and, and think, well, then they're choosing not to do it every time. But, <laughs> but there are so many pieces that have to be in place for them mm -hmm. to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. So and we don't teach it directly. And that's why right. I do what I do. You know, it's sort of a mystery that in, in what you said, they choose. Choose implies it's a won't. So mm -hmm. we talk about the can't and the won't. If they just choose, if they just choose, are choosing to be defiant or to not try or whatever, then that is that they won't. Right. And now once they get more in the middle and high school and they're more jaded, it often becomes more of a won't. Mm hmm you know, but, but it initially, it, they still can't at that point, but it's right. a can't and a won't. But when they're younger, it's really a can't. And mm -hmm. can you imagine being told, you know, let's say you can't, I'm, I'm learning to, to kite surf right now. I, I can't do, I'm not, I, I just finished my lessons. I can barely do it. I cannot do, if, if you said try harder, I'm going to injure myself. If you said mm -hmm. play the trumpet, I can play guitar because I've been doing it for 25 years. I can't play the trumpet today. I do, you know, but we say that to these kids thinking that they just, it's, it's a won't. Right. So what I do is I say, uh, so I, I, I'm definitely a nerd and I definitely nerd out on this stuff, but I say, how do we take this person who's resistant and has had all these experiences and doesn't have the skills and can't, and how do we get them from that point to the point where, they can. And it's what I call good enough executive function, because mm. it's certainly not perfect. And it's certainly not as good as anybody who has naturally linear thinking, somebody with na naturally strong executive function, like that's a strength uh, of theirs. So like, we're not looking for that. We're looking for how do they have good enough executive function that, and this is how I frame it, that the parent can breathe a sigh of relief and go, ah, yeah. This kid's gonna be okay. It's not yeah. perfect, but they're gonna be okay. They can figure out life that they're gonna they're gonna be able to accomplish their goals. Yeah. How do we get to that to that point? Is what this is all about. Mm -hmm. And and I think some of that is, you know, really discovering what are the skills or what are the factors underneath that problem. I know we always look at things that way. When we look at learning and attention, 
Well, if you've got a bright child who is really struggling to learn to read or do math, well, let's look underneath the academics and find out what skills under there are not supporting them well enough. And I think, you know, executive function, there are just so many pieces to the puzzle can be like that too. And I know you've talked about that kind of as that piece that we see that we think is laziness or lack of caring or motivation. It, it, that's That behavior is really just the tip of the iceberg. So what's going on that we don't always see with these kids? Yeah, well, that sort of brings up two things. One is this iceberg theory, which I think I'll, maybe I'll come back to. Um, but the other is on that journey from, so like I was saying before about that, I'm a nerd about this stuff. What I mean by that is I have obsessively thought about this stuff for years and tried to really come up with a model that makes sense that I can communicate to other people. So here's sort of how the model works. You've got a student at point A, you wanna get them to point B. Now, not only, I have to say this, not only are we dealing with the student, their executive function skills and the resistance, we're also dealing with the iceberg theory, what's going on underneath the tip of the iceberg. Um, is, there, is, is there past trauma that hasn't been integrated? And I'm not talking about just a traumatic event. Trauma is very complex, but but trauma that has sort of been low level ongoing. There can be many types, but is there past trauma that hasn't been dealt with? Is there a dyscalculia, uh, a math disability? Like what kinds of things have not even been identified that are below the tip? But so we have those things with the person, but we also at point A have to contend with the let's use the word programming of the parents, teachers, society, culture, the school. Mm -hmm. We have been quote programmed. And what I mean by that, I'm not getting woo woo and I'm not getting conspiracy theory with you here. What I am saying is that we have grown up with messaging that implies certain things. You, you might've grown up with, you have to go to college and that's the path for everyone. And getting all A's is important. And, you know, so we, we, we have to sift through at this point A, like not only how do we help the kid, but also what misinformation are we using that's been driving our choices and words and thoughts mm -hmm. and behaviors and trying to intervene and help this child? Because we, we need to be real honest with ourselves if we want to help this kid about uh, what's really important. You know, we, we default to what well, we've, We've heard these messages so much throughout our life, you know, that they're true. Well, I've been doing this a long time. Uh, Jill's been doing this a long time. I mean, we have, uh, again, probably both obsessed uh, so much on, wow, this doesn't work for kids. That doesn't work for kids. Now, a lot of things work for kids. A lot of teachers are great for kids, and blah, but there is a lot of misinformation and old patterning that needs to change. So anyhow, we need to sift through that at point A. We're trying to get to point B. What do the kids need to get from point A to B? The way that I teach it in my model is three things. Your kids need three things. If you were going to get them to point A, from point A to point B, where you're going, okay, this kid's going to be okay. They got good enough executive function. What do they need? Three things, systems, mindsets, habits, and routines. What does that mean? Systems. So this is where there could be a curriculum in schools to teach executive function stuff, but there's not. So kids who sort of pick up on it um, over the years, they they see. it seems like they're trying harder. They're not, they've actually been working at taking suggestions from teachers and parents for years and they've created systems. What kind of systems? I'll give you a couple of systems. One system is how to use a planner or calendar or agenda. Another system is how to make a daily plan and think through what you have to do each day or each evening when you get home from school. Another system is how to organize your folders, binders or accordion folders or papers or stuff like that. Another system is how do you organize your backpack or your locker or your desk? So you might not think of a backpack as a system, but that is a system of organization. Now, if you have a child who just mashes everything into the abyss of the backpack and the teacher says, get a pencil out and they just reach in there and grab one and they find broken pencils in every pocket and, you know, it, well, 
that's a system, but they ha- they do not know how to uh, intentionally, mindfully, um, consciously use that system in a really effective way. It's good enough to get you off their back, but it's really not uh, a good system. But anyhow, so those are some systems, some systems. So the good news is, is there, there's not an infinite number of systems. This isn't some abstract concept. The kids need a certain amount of basic systems in order to navigate school, maybe 10 or so that I teach. Mindsets. Well, let's start with the resistance mindset. The mindset we don't want is we don't want the resistance mindset to rule us. Okay. So if we're just resistant to something, um, we want to, if we're just resistant to it, then we'd let it boss us around. We all have resistance. Every single one of you watching, you know, you think about a chore that you hate. Like you might, like I like doing windows. I hate doing floors. True story. Um, you know, like we all have, we all have mindsets about certain things, but that's a resistance mindset. I don't feel like doing that. That's not a type of thing I like. Um, paying my taxes. I don't mind the paying the taxes. I mind doing the taxes. That is just makes my head spin. It's not my strength area. So anyhow, we have resistance mindsets that say, I don't want to do this. This is not fun. I'm not good at it. So these are mindsets that keep us out of execution. What we need with mindsets is mindsets like Carol Dweck. She did research and wrote a book called Mindset, but she talks about growth mindset. But essentially mindsets that we want are mindsets that we can execute. Okay, this is daunting. I have a big mountain. I have a lot of makeup work to do, whatever. You know, this isn't a fun class, but I need to get this work done. I can do it. Let's go ahead and get started. I can get rid of my distractions. Um, you know, the, we want to have a can do mindset rather than a resistance mindset. So we we have a mindset of that keeps us from execution and we have, have a mindset that empowers us to execute. Systems, mindsets. Do you remember the third one I mentioned? The third one I mentioned is habits and routines. If we have systems, great. If we have mindsets, that help us move through the resistance, great. But if we don't have habits and routines to continue to maintain and refine those systems and to refine and and improve upon our mindsets, doesn't do us any good. So if I, you know, again, I love guitars, but if I know how to play some guitar and I don't, have a routine for practice or good habits for strumming or picking or arpeggios or whatever, then I'm going to be a sloppy player. I'm not going to be able to accomplish my goals with within that area. But with school, we need the systems, the mindsets, because if your kid is just told, I'll give you a hundred bucks if you get straight A's, but that's the reward. Uh, you'll be punished and lose privileges if you don't do this. Um, I'm going to lecture you, nag you, bug you, logic you, use reason, help you see the light. You know, if we're going to this stuff, again, that's not changing their mindset. So they need these systems. They need real mindsets and they need real habits and routines. So to get from that point A to point B, those are the, those are the three basic things that I'm helping people do. So I'm helping them build those things. Now, here's the problem, parents and teachers. Even though I try to make it as linear as possible, this is not super linear. Okay, I can outline all the stuff people want to know, well, where do I start, Seth? Do I start with the systems, mindsets, habits, and routines? Which ones, which system do I start with? Which mindset do I start? This is not linear. People are looking for a, you know, I have a roadmap and I teach a roadmap, but that's very misleading. The roadmap shows the 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 components uh, of how this stuff works, but it, 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 this is abstract. There's a lot of abstraction. There's a lot of nuance that I can't just say, here's the recipe. These are complex human beings we're dealing with here. Mm-hmm. It's not just, you know, do the recipe and my kid will change. That, that is not it. So what's the key here then? What's the key here? Well, some of the abstractions, I'll mention two abstractions that we deal with, and then I really want to hear some questions and, and anything from you, Jill. And But two things that we really want to deal with 
One is relationships and one is emotional regulation. So relationships, if these kids don't feel just as any of you watching, all of you watching right now can think of somebody you wouldn't tell certain things to. You wouldn't tell your secrets. You wouldn't tell things that are very personal to you. Why wouldn't you tell them? Well, you might not know them. You might not trust them. If you don't know them, certainly you don't trust them. So would you go and just tell a stranger just a bunch of things about yourself and your family and your personal thoughts? And, you, you know, we, so we need to feel safe and our kids need to feel what's called secure attachment. If you want to research something called attachment theory, that's one of the most important things I can ever recommend to you. Your kids want to feel like they can come to you, they can be who they are, and that you will see them, you will hear them, they will feel heard by you, they will feel seen, they will feel understood, they'll feel like you've got their back. Now, you know you've got their back, but they don't necessarily feel. Listen very closely to this. You know, and I think a lot of people get confused on this, you know you've got their back, you know you are trying to listen, you know you try to help, you know you have their best interests in mind, but they don't necessarily feel heard, seen, understood by you. So that relationship piece, I cannot get a resistant teenager to listen to the Seth idiot guy that they don't even know unless I build a safe and secure relationship where they know I will see them and help them be understood. I cannot do my work until I first start to build that relationship. And then I must maintain that. They always, you know, a, a parent can be freaking out. My kid still has all Fs. What's going on? I cannot help the kid turn that around if I go all anxious on the kid and be like, why didn't you turn it? You know, the relationship, they have to know they're safe. That's the only way we move forward. This is a very slow process. People want a quick fix. That's the world we live in. That's not reality. These are complex human beings. Two, emotional regulation. Resistance is a physical experience. Think about a food you hate. And now imagine yourself eating that food. Some of you watching right now are making a face right now. Oh, I can't <laughs> even imagine eating that. Um, so we th that's resistance even with food, okay? But you are having a physical experience based on your thought about a thing. And they're having a physical experience. They're they, now, they have to learn to regulate emotion, regulate feelings, know what's going on. We don't teach what's going on in the body. Any of you watching who know what's going on in the body is because you, you um, maybe you do yoga or meditate or read books about it or learn about somatic therapies or things like, but many of us don't really, know how the body is communicating messages to us, okay? So we want to teach them how to regulate. This is a very surfacey explanation, Jill. Mm -hmm. It's something we could spend hours on, but just real briefly, we, they need to understand how to regulate emotion to us. So what I was, just to circle back to the beginning, this is not a linear process. Seth, give me a recipe. Help me figure out what's going on with my kid. Let's get from that point A to point B, and let's do it right now this semester, and, and uh, we'll be great for the fall. Mm -mm. We got a long, messy, nonlinear journey. We can know the pieces of the puzzle, but it's a very, and it's very different from family to family. Emotional regulation is going to look different. Relationship is going to look different from family to family. Um, and so there's all kinds of nuance all around that. You know, uh, I, I love the things you were talking about with, with kids need systems, mindset and habits and routines. And, you know, when, when we work with our kids on executive function, it's like, oh, and there's this and this and this and this that we need to work on. You know, as you said, it's like, where do we, where do we start? Well, you start with one thing okay. and, and then really work with that mindset and systems and routines around that. And we're, we're so, you know, impatient to get everything solved, but 
And it doesn't matter what one thing, if, if right. they come to you or I, and, it, and it's, let's say towards the end of the semester and they're failing all of our classes, you and I are going into triage mode and we're looking at the urgent stuff. And we see that they have, you know, a 500 point paper that's bringing their grade down. We're going to start with that and use the things around that to drive what we're teaching as we're doing that thing. And we're you and I aren't sitting there saying, are we doing this skill and this? I mean, some of it is conscious, but like these things are so um, interrelated. Right. That, you know, you, you're really impacting a lot of things by helping in, in, with one thing. I don't know if that makes sense. Right. Well, let's, let's check in with our viewers and see what's coming up there in the chat. Uh, this is LD Expert Live. Our guest today is Seth Perler, and we've been talking about a very hot topic, executive function. Oh, yes. And it's definitely <laughs> resonating with a lot of parents. We have a lot of um, just agreeing with you, uh, you know, Karen, uh, shout out saying thank you to SLC and Seth Perler for all that you do for struggling kids. You talked about, you know, that special population that definitely is a lot of our kiddos that we we love. Um, when you were talking about shame, um, definitely something that resonates, you know, that those past experiences, trauma, they, they impact our lives, we can, you know, think back on on just different experiences with ourselves as as students in school, things like that. And they, you know, so Joanna is saying it, it impacts our lives both in the present and in the future. Mm -hmm. um, Joanna is, is commenting, talking about her own kids learning to make choices is the hardest. I teach stop, challenge your thoughts and then choose to make a choice. Mm -hmm. um, and she also, you know, is saying that sometimes it's, a, it's boredom, lack of patience. Um, and especially as parents, when we see our kids are smart, also our own <laughs> lack of patience that, you know, they're smart and want the answers now, and we want them to be able to change now. So definitely, you know, a lack of patience on, on the part of the child, but also parents as well. Um, we have um, some, you know, just agreement, you know, when you talk about, you know, building executive function skills, Becky saying, yes, I need to get there. <laughs> <laughs> um, and Diana saying those feelings of shame, guilt and failure have sent our son into a depression, horrible cycle mm -hmm. we're working through. So yes, definitely something we see in our, in our kids all the time. Um, we have a, a past guest, Deborah Anafarian, uh, with Helping the Behaviorally Challenging Child. She was on a, a show, I believe, on February 2nd. Um, she said, the reason I became so passionate about this field to understand ADHD is because I was shamed and blamed as a kid mm -hmm. when ADHD wasn't a thing. I was diagnosed with ADHD at 46, along with my son, who was diagnosed at nine. And I absolutely... I was absolutely determined not to have the shame and blame visited upon him. The struggle is real. I tried to explain that he wasn't choosing to be the way he is. His chooser was broken. <laughs> it was hard because he is 2E, twice exceptional, and so very inconsistent and smart enough to do better. And then she kind of got cut off. But thank you for being part of the solution. So definitely resonating with her. And she kind of talked about on her episode in the vein of, these kids and behavior and how mm -hmm. they're not, I mean, they're not choosing to be bad kids and trying to change that label. Um, we posted the, the, you know, for parents to recap those three things that um, kids need to get from point A to point B systems, mindsets, habits, and routines. So that's in the chat in case um, you didn't remember parents and you need to follow along the book that you referenced. Um, Mindset by Carol S. Dweck um, is something we've referenced on the show before. Mindset, um, we posted that in the chat as well. Um, we do have, so Katie um, saying, love it. We start the day with positive thoughts and end the day with what we're grateful for and what mm -hmm. we are nice. proud of that day. Um, but she does have a question. She has, it looks like a seven-year-old. She's asking specifically, how can we help young ones, my, her son is seven, with systems specifically? Cool. Uh, you want me to go ahead and address that right now? And we go into a little yeah. bit of Q&A. Great. Okay. Great question. So I get that question a lot. How do we help? Because I work with middle high school and college students. The reason I generally work with them is because generally that's when things fall apart. But things have been unraveling for a long time before 
we see that they've fallen apart. It's mm -hmm. just that when a kid goes into, let's say, a middle school and all of a sudden they don't have the skills and all of a sudden the handholding stops and, and they don't use a planner and yada, yada, and, and they suddenly have a bunch of Fs and they've always had Bs and Cs, it's like the red flags there. So what about youngers? That's a question I get all the time. I also get what about me, the parent or teachers, you know, I struggle with this stuff. What do you, or, or yeah, I got diagnosed in my thirties, forties, fifties with ADHD or something. And I, I am struggling with this. How do I apply this stuff to me? So the thing that I want to say about that is that, that the principles and the concepts are the same no matter what. So I have like an uh, I have like a systems assessment somewhere on my site, and that systems assessment says something like backpack. Well, if you have like a you know if you have a seven year old or you know if you're uh, in your forties, how do you apply that? Well, backpack might be your car. <laughs> the backpack might be your purse. The backpack mm -hmm. might you know might be a drawer. You know, do you have a system of organization? So think about the principle. What's a backpack for? It's to organize important things that are non-preferred. Now, if you're in, if you're seven and you have a preferred activity like Legos, uh, you probably have some system. Like if you're missing something, you're probably going to notice it and be like, where's my mm -hmm. such and such? Who took my thing? Um, you know, because they're, you, you value that. We're talking uh, again with execution about things that aren't, you know, as important. Do you have a system for your taxes? Like I mentioned that before, where you are, you know, organizing them, even though it's non-preferred. Well, it might be preferred for some of you. For me, it's not, but I do <laughs> have a system. So anyhow, the, the systems can be adapted um, to whatever age. So it's the principles behind the system. So let's take a look at a seven-year-old. Can you help a seven-year-old plan? Many, 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 many ways. One concept I want to leave with you is visual, 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 visual. The more you can make things visual or, or visual and tactile and auditory, the more you can make things sensory, the more you can make cues, cueing, cues for schedules, even at that age. Maybe you have a magnet chart on the refrigerator that you just made with some scrap paper and tape or magnets or whatever, and your kid drew the pictures of the different activities that you do every day, maybe breakfast, brushing teeth, blah, 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 and they can reorder them, and that is planning. Maybe at night they uh, wash their face, put on their pajamas, and brush their teeth, um, and and maybe in the maybe in the bathroom you make a separate chart where they can move magnets to those three things and they can reorder them and choose their order that they want to do those three things. That is planning. Maybe you can start using the words, the cue words that you want. Like, hey, let's plan your evening. Hey, let's plan bedtime. Hey, let's plan, you know, your afternoon. Hey, let's plan free time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I always say it doesn't even matter if you follow the plan. It matters that you make the plan. Half the time, these kids don't follow their plan. But they're getting way more done than they would have had they not had the plan. So again, we're, we got to be real careful. We'll, we'll be real aware of what the goal is here. But you can start planning now as far as organization. Let's look at organization um, of drawers for T-shirts, for socks, for pants or whatever uh, shoes. You know, you can have shoes can go on the floor in the closet, but you could also just make a box and the kid can draw. You can take a photo of the shoes, stick it on there. You can draw shoes, stick it on there, write the word shoes, do a combination, visual, visual, visual. And you know, when it's time for clean up your room, it's not time for clean up your room. It's time for one task at a time, put your shoes away. And it's not abstract anymore. Clean up your room is abstract and overwhelming for, mm -hmm. for these kids. For right. kids who are highly organized, they really enjoy that. They, their brain is thinking, they, these kids, it's it's not as intuitive. So we want to give that structure. Um, <clears throat> you know, the drawer with t-shirts, let's say, it can just say t-shirts or shirts, or they can draw the picture or whatever. And so it's not clean up the floor, it's put the t-shirts away. It's one task at a time. Now, <clears throat> when we do that, we're also helping them do what I call chunking. 
So we're not saying again, to use the clean your room, we're not saying clean your room, we're saying we're going to chunk this into a small manageable task. Imagine if a kid is learning just simple planning and organizational skills uh, with these are two systems at this age, we're not even directly, we're indirectly, we're directly teaching it technically. But what I'm saying is, we're not saying I'm going to teach you this today. We're just walking them through the motions over and over and over and over and over. Imagine how they're going to be when they're 12 years old and they think, oh, I, they're going to start thinking, oh, I need a place for this. Oh, I need to label this. Mm -hmm. Oh, where is my home for this? Where's my home? And now imagine the kid who never had that and they, they aren't having those thoughts over and over. They haven't had those thoughts for all the years before. So they're not thinking, oh, I better create a system or a place for, to organize this, or I better figure out a way to manage my time and in, in this homework tonight, or I better plan. So that that's that's the gist of what I guess might be helpful to how do you adapt up or down. Mm -hmm. And as far as the, the, the mindsets real quick, I do want to talk about defaults. So we tend to, what I'll do when I start working with a new kid is I'll, I'll do a lot of questioning. I'm just asking them things and just listening to them, but I'll hear them say something and I'll kind of jot it down and I might put a little tally by it. So I might hear a kid say, I might say, well, so do you use a planner? And they're like, no, planners don't work for me. Okay. Uh, so how's it going with math? Oh yeah, that math class doesn't work for me. Yeah, okay. Well, how's it going with folders or three ring binders? Oh, I, I, by the <laughs> way, Seth doesn't approve of binders for my kids. Um, side mm -hmm. note. Uh, so how's that binder working? Oh yeah. Binders don't work for me. So I just heard him say, doesn't work for me three times. I know that that's a mindset that they have. Then now I have mm -hmm. some evidence and I could go, you know, I noticed that you keep saying it doesn't work for me. What, what do you, why do you think you say it doesn't work for me or I'm bad at or whatever. So when you're looking at somebody's defaults, now this is, I, I'm getting into very challenging territory here with parents because there are parents here that are listening, Jill, I'm, I'm guessing that are going, oh, well, then I can help them. Now I can help them see, you know, all, all of their mindsets because they always say this. Well, beware, your parent, your kid is way less likely to hear it from you than Jill or I, first of all. <laughs> Second of all, if you are going to go down that road, you can, but how you do it really has to do with the attachment theory. And are they in a place where they're receiving that? They're not receiving it and they're not feeling heard. This is a useless conversation you're going to have with them. It's going to create more distance and less motivation, which is not what you want. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So you, you, you did answer two questions. Tammy was asking, how do you suggest to help get from resistance mindset to can do thinking? So you definitely. Well, another way it. is to practice it. So you don't just stop. Mm -hmm doing something, right? I don't just stop eating a pint of ice cream every night. I start eating, you know, a piece of fruit every night instead of that. I, this is just a silly example, but we don't just stop resistance thinking. We have to replace it. So I, I do want to mention that too. Like our messaging, I talk about the three to one rule, try to use three positives to everyone perceived negative with your child. Mm -hmm. um, the the um, Karen Tui boys talks about that that kids hear 20 to 30 negatives for every one positive. So the messaging kids hear over and over and over and over and over and over and over really goes in there and, and it encourages patterning. So we need to really, the person who said, you know, they do like gratitude with their child every night and start off with these positive things in the morning. Like that's the way to do it. Like to really, um, really, how do we start change the conversations and replace it and really fill it with, these are your strengths. That was so awesome. Um, uh, you know, really not in a, not in a fake way. These have to be authentic. Mm -hmm. We authentically right. notice what's quote wrong or not going right or what we don't approve of. Right. Can we spend more energy on what's going right? And that's very hard for us to change. I'm sure Jill, I'm sure you do. I'm sure a lot of your magic is in that because that's what mm -hmm. I would not make any traction with my kids if I didn't do that all the time. I'm sure you, you'd probably do the same, Jill. Like mm -hmm. you notice the heck out of every single positive thing all the time. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, this is this is exactly resonating, especially, you know, the the you know, the viewers we have today that do have younger kids, you know, how do you um, and you talked about, thank you, that was really helpful about just establishing those 
systems teaching them one thing to do. We definitely in our centers use visuals a lot and mm-hmm. our kids look forward to it. Um, you know, so, so Katie, just, uh, you know, you asked about your seven-year-old and with following multi-step tasks. And so exactly what Seth recommended with visuals of just, okay, first we're going to do this and, and, you know, it might be a picture and second, we're going to do this. And then, you know, choosing to change the order because maybe it makes more sense to do one thing first than something else after that. Um, all of that is, is what, uh, planning, you know, kids get that benefit of planning and organizing and being in control. Also, that's a that's a big component of it. I feel I have ownership and I have control over my choices. Um, and that helps to develop their executive function skills. We've seen um, huge changes with little guys and even kids that that don't have as much language by using visuals, definitely. Um, and Lauren, can I we, add on a nuanced thought to that too? <sighs> when Lauren said that you can, so basically you have a multi, multi-step process. So you would chunk those down into the individual steps. And that's not always concrete because sometimes, so, but you can all figure that out on your own. But Lauren talked about the order and she said, sometimes they can choose the order. I really, 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 really want to caution you to not rescue and enable if they quote mess up the order or don't get it right Mm -hmm. what a great opportunity for them to go through a process in a safe way and it doesn't work and instead of saying instead of rescuing or or using the logic or reason or whatever like saying wow that's interesting what are you going to do to solve that problem what are your ideas Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. And and really giving them some agency and, and ownership and, and um, power in that circumstance. You know, that is a great learning opportunity. Um, yeah. It, it, well, it definitely is. I'm just, I'm just resonating with what you're saying. Yeah. I mean, we, we learn by trying something and having it not work. And that's mm-hmm. how we begin to rewire our brain by recognizing, oh, that didn't work. I have to try something else. And so really making it an environment where that's actually a positive thing. Wow, you tried this. What happened there? What what else what else might you try? You know, and I love the intentionality of using words like um, you know, validating that they're planning and they're, you know, they're solving a problem. You know, we just those are executive function skills. And so we want to be really intentional about just kind of building that into our language. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I'm just resonating with everything. No, <laughs> and this is kind of this is kind of what we're seeing in the comments. I mean, just just people say, okay, I try this, or this is, this has really helped me with my child. We have we have um, Joanna here who actually has an adult son. Um, you know, she says, tell my kids, say a positive statement about being successful each day, celebrate three positive things. So that goes to your three to one rule. Don't compare yourself to someone else. Look at your own progress. Uh, Joanna later shares that she has an adult son. Uh, my son was sometimes smarter than his teacher. His challenge now is that he's in the Marines and he's on his phone and the internet more than he should and does not make friends easily. He's a right fighter and we are working to help him to be aware that he has to allow others to be right (laughs) and Mm. to stop trying to get everyone to agree with him. It causes fights and others don't want to interact with him. He is exhausting, but we love him. Um, So, so can you speak to that element a little bit of, you know, in executive function, there is also a social component or effects. It has social consequences because of, I mean, there's resistance there too. Um, Seth, do you have any like advice for when, um, you know, we always, when we talk about executive function, a lot of parents chime in because we think about school, but also, you know, adults, you said their life, their life is different. It could be, it could have social consequences, any suggestions or advice for when it does lead into the social aspects of not wanting to listen or accept someone else's opinion, things like that. I mean, there, there's so many things to think about with this, but I think the first thing that this brings me back to is that this is not linear and this, and the advice Mm -hmm. that I would give one parent wouldn't be the advice that I would give another parent, um, depending on the, the dynamics of the family, the personality of the kid, like it really, and, and, uh, and I also want to encourage you in a really, all in a really positive way that like 
we were talking about before, this isn't like a, where do you start? Like, it's not like a linear start here. Like just starting with anything is, is good. So as far as, you know, the social thing, the part of what I'm thinking about in this sort of, with executive function in particular, one of the, one of the many aspects of executive function that this reminds me of is the impulsivity and inhibition. So you have impulsivity on one side of the coin and inhibition on the other side of the coin. Uh, when we are impulsive, we are not inhibiting. Okay. So when we are inhibiting, we are not being impulsive. So you can look at it that way. Now, this is a very, again, a very surfacey explanation, but socially, one thing that we can do is to objectify or depersonalize these concepts in a really positive way with kids. So in order to depersonalize something like that, and, and I'm saying in a positive way, there's also negative ways to depersonalize something and objectify something, but this is a very positive way. And here's what I mean. We, we can, and I do this all the time with my kids. So um, say, hey, I notice that your brain, or I can say my brain, you know, I don't want to call them out. Well, it depends on my relationship with them. But, you know, our brains um, want to, you, you know, sometimes are impulsive. Our brains, so I'm not saying you're being impulsive. Mm -hmm. our, our brains are sometimes impulsive. And sometimes we don't think before we say something. And sometimes there are consequences. Then I might use a story from my life. One time, I, I always use this one story because I was living in Los Angeles, driving on the busiest highway on earth, and I flipped someone off. I never do this. I don't think I've ever done it before. I've never done it since. But that was a moment of impulsivity, <laughs> and there were consequences. You almost, I, I wouldn't say that to just any kid. I would say that to some of my angsty teenagers, though. But I might put it on me because uh, so you need to really think about the dynamic. Are you going to say, you know, hey, when you do this, there are social consequences? Again, if it's being received, that's great. The, the whole thing has to do with it if it's being received. It's, if it's not being received, you have to re-strategize. So I might tell a story, hey, I was impulsive and I did this, blah, 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 can you relate? Like the more I can get them to take ownership and buy in in the social situations, the better. Another thing is, is that a lot of kids, um, in, in my experience, a lot of kids, when that relationship is there and they feel heard by you, they want, they want and appreciate knowing about social rules and why people do certain things. They don't want to just be told, hey, here's how you act. They want to understand why people are perceiving things. Now, we don't all ha have the answers to everything, but to try to explain things to kids like, I, you know, you know, I've had a lot of discussions with kids, really bright kids who'll be like, well, that that's fake and that's blah, blah. And that's not authentic. And it's like, cool. You listen to them, like go down that. Well, yeah. Yeah. So what's the big picture here? Is there ever a time when you should be fake? Is there ever a, a good mm -hmm. reason for that? What, you know, like I want them to come up with their own answers. I don't even always want them to even come up with their own answers. I want them to walk away asking their own questions. That's when I've really done some good. Right. If they walk away from me and they come back a month later and maybe I see them three times a week, every week. And but a month later, they come back to that conversation. And they say, you know, Seth, after we talked that one time, I've been watching people in high school and I noticed, well, like they have that. They have been asking the question, That's really thinking huge. about it. Like I'm not yeah. saving them. I'm like, I, I really want them walking away with that residue of the conversation. Um, so that they're developing introspection, metacognition, self-reflection, self-awareness. Yeah. And so there's some comments on that. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Yeah. We always, I mean, something in our executive function training, when we've done it throughout the years and I tell parents, there has to be some kind of emotional connection. And you, you talked about that, at, you know, dealing with resistance and sometimes processing something we didn't like, or that was unpleasant after the effect after the fact in a neutral way can help to, to launch some of those questions of like, mm -hmm. Hey, I, you know, I notice, um, you know, for the kid to be start noticing things in their own environment or notice how people respond to them um, as just kind of a springboard for changing behavior. So right. those two words, I notice, write them mm -hmm. on a sticky mm -hmm. note that that's a yeah. brilliant tool. Yeah. I notice you know, and then don't ruin it by once they respond, <laughs> starting to respond to the response right away. Let it marinate. Say, tell me yeah. more. Like I call it wait time, but like that art of yeah. 
the art of being quiet. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> so good. I, and so we, we have, I mean, just a lot of people chiming in. Thank you. Great advice. You know, great ideas. Thank you. Uh, because it does, it does resonate a lot with, with parents. Um, we, I want to make sure that we get to um, the rest that you have to share. So we're going to check back in one more time with questions or comments. So parents keep posting, um, you know, if you're watching us live, say hi, let us know where you're from. Um, but keep posting your questions and comments and we'll check back in one more time. You know, Lauren, we are, we are actually at the top of our hour and I just want to point people to Seth's website, sethperler.com. He has tons of information there for mm -hmm. both blog and video for parents, for teachers, for kids. So if we don't get to you today, check that out because uh, you're going to find just lots and lots of, of answers there. Um, I wanted to, before we wrap up today, Seth, I really wanted to have you share a little bit about um, a, an event that's coming up in August. It is a virtual executive function summit. And um, I'd love for you to talk about that. I think that it's going to be an incredible resource for parents and educators. Sure. Yeah. Thanks. If somebody wants to pop the link in the chat, it's called um, it's called executivefunctionsummit.com. So a few years ago, I started an executive function summit. I know that you all are sick and tired of online everything, or I am at least like we have so much screen time. But this, we really do an amazing job. So I get um, I get about 25 experts from all over the place that talk about some aspect of ex executive function. And my intention for the weekend really is, is that um, it's for parents. It's not for teachers. Teachers can go. A lot of teachers go. But it's specifically for parents. So when I'm talking to the experts, I'm asking specific. And, and I interview the, the experts pretty hard, too. I'm, I'm not easy on them. But I really want you to walk away with two things. I want you to walk away with knowledge and I want you to walk away with actions. So uh, what good is the knowledge if you don't know what to do with it? So I don't like when experts just get heavy into theory. I want you to understand their theory and know what the heck to do. So uh, I'm really pushy about that with the experts. And, um, and my intention for you is to saturate yourself in this executive function stuff for a weekend so that when you walk away from it, your head is spinning and you're just like, oh my gosh, this is so overwhelming. But as the mud starts to settle, people really walk away with an amazing, amazing understanding of how to better serve their kid. A lot of it has to do with relationships because it's so important and emotional regulation, as I mentioned, because that's so important. Mm -hmm. So that's the Executive Function Summit and I love it. And uh, yeah, so it's free for the weekend and then we sell it if you wanna buy the, um, the copies of it. Well, it's, it is going to be an incredible event for parents and educators. Um, let's go ahead and put up the link up here and we'll put it in the chat too. So if you want to pre-register for the Virtual Executive Function Summit, uh, you can do that with this link that's on your screen and we'll put that in the chat as well. Oh, that looks um, great. Thanks for doing that. Uh, I would, I'll, I'll check back in real quickly with Lauren if there are any questions that we just have to connect on. Otherwise, I'm going to refer people to uh, Seth's web, website, sethperler.com. Um, and uh, Lauren, you can also talk to people a little bit about Mom Squad to continue the conversation. Absolutely. And so that's what a lot of people are saying, you know, to subscribe to your website, to tune into your weekly vlog um, that, you know, you have a lot of really good resources, sethperler.com. Um, and, and so Karen is, you know, she's a diehard fan. So she wants to you know, remind everybody about your vlog and your website just as resources for parents. Um, and Lan is tuning in. She attended uh, your summit last year and it was oh, excellent. Right. So they're kind of, Thank yeah, <laughs> definitely. Yeah, you that yeah. link there, the bit.ly one. Mm -hmm. Yes. And so we posted, we posted the link to the executive function summit in the chat. Um, and yes, yeah, so, so if we didn't get to your question, um, we do have, we, it looks like, um, you know, somebody posting about mental flexibility, um, is a, is a big one. If we didn't get to your question, I would suggest going to sethperler.com and to look at the resources there. And then we can continue the conversation in mom squad. That is our private Facebook group. 
Um, you can find it on our Facebook page or going to Facebook groups, SLC Mom Squad, uh, by searching Facebook groups, SLC Mom Squad. That is a private Facebook group for parents of kids and teens with learning and attention challenges. And I'm posting guides. Um, guides are a collection of resources on various topics. And I do have one on executive function. We posted um, some suggestions on task flow charts and mapping out decisions and tasks, um, as well as an executive function continuum um, is in there. So you can find that in SLC Mom Squad. And through Mom Squad, we have an interactive education and support group meeting um, on Zoom called PEACE. PEACE stands for Parent Education, Parent Enrichment and Continuing Education. Um, it's our monthly support group we meet on Zoom. Our March topic is on core learning skills and retain reflexes. And we know that that has a huge correlation to executive function skills because it's the foundation of how we're organized. So we'll be meeting Thursday, March 18th at 5 p.m. Pacific time. You do need to register at stollcenter.com slash peace to get the registration link. Um, and I, I'm looking forward to seeing you there. Um, thank you so much to everyone who has participated, questions and comments and, and everywhere, you know, everyone tuning in from all over the country, really uh, relevant topic for, for today and every day, really. Um, so thank you so much for that. Thank you, Lauren. And Seth, thank you so much for all your insights that you shared with viewers today. Man, this was packed. It's going to be something we're going to need to uh, go back and, and replay and listen to several times. Great stuff. Cool. Thanks so much. Thanks, Lauren. It's so cool to hear you talk. I don't know Lauren well, and just to see what amazing things you're doing. And Joe, what amazing things you, you both are doing, what you all are doing. Um, I'm so excited. I, I just love seeing all of the neat things that you offer. People really need it. I'm saying this in front of everybody just because I, I just like to really acknowledge and appreciate and show gratitude for people who are just doing stuff to help our kids. So from the bottom of my heart, thank you so much for showing up on the planet in this way. Well, thank you. And right, right back to you. I, uh, your work is so needed and so appreciated. Here is Seth's contact information. He has all kinds of practical, free information and videos about executive function for parents, teachers, and kids. So check out his website and YouTube channel. This is LD Expert Live, your place for answers and solutions for learning disabilities, dyslexia, and attention challenges. We're live every Tuesday at 10 a.m. Pacific on Facebook and YouTube. So next Tuesday, we have neuropsychologists, Dr. Oren Boxer and Dr. Samantha O'Bannon here with us to answer your questions about testing and to talk about how to get the most out of your IEP, how to help kids cope and preparing for the return to school campuses. So be sure and join us here next Tuesday at 10. Stowell Learning Centers are open for remote screenings and sessions, so you can access our services wherever you are in the world. We're also seeing students on site with all the COVID precautions. At Stowell Learning Centers, we help children and adults permanently resolve their learning and attention challenges. If you would like a free consultation for yourself or your child, give us a call or visit our website at stowellcenter.com. Thank you again, Seth, for such valuable information. And thank you all of you who joined us live in the, in the chat and commented and asked questions and to all of you joining us on the replay. You probably know other parents who are searching for answers for their child's resistance or executive function challenges. So please pass this episode along. We'll see you next week.